It's good to worship this morning with the family here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. Thank you, David, and choir and orchestra, praise team, sound and lighting volunteers for just a great time of worship already today. I want you to go ahead and take your Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. I want to give you a chance to find that. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. And I want to begin just a series of messages with you this morning as we again prepare for Advent and prepare for the Lord's coming. Uh, so if you'll go ahead and find that, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Now, as you're finding that, let me just uh, give you a, a heads up about what is going to be happening at the end of our worship service today. We are in the midst of praying through a budget for 2015, and as is the uh, procedure here at Campbellsville Baptist Church, this budget has been presented. We've had uh, an open time for discussion, uh, but what we've been doing the past couple of years is we voted on the budget at the conclusion of a morning worship service. And so that will be happening today. So when our worship service, or rather at, at the conclusion of our worship service, uh, we're going to be passing out some ballots, and that will give you the opportunity to vote yes or no on the proposed budget. We've mailed a copy to every family. Uh, our budget and finance committee has been very good about presenting the budget, helping us understand it. And we've all been taking now a, a couple of weeks to pray it through and to seek the Lord's will together. So we'll be culminating that today. And then also let me uh, give you a word of encouragement about supporting our current budget. As we approach the end of the year, we've got some catching up to do. And so let me encourage you to be faithful to the commitment that we've all made to the Lord to support the growth of the kingdom through what happens here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. And if, if, if you feel a sense to get caught up in your giving, there's no better time than right now to do that. So uh, let me give you that word of encouragement today. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. If you'll have that in front of you, if you'll stand in honor of God's word as I read the passage aloud. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. God's word for us today. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. You know, I, I just, uh, I have to be honest with you this morning. Of all the things that I love about Christmas, and I do love Christmas, uh, I, I, I want to be like, uh, like Ebenezer Scrooge at the end of that famous story, The Christmas Carol. At the end of that story, Charles Dickens said about Ebenezer Scrooge that of all the people that kept Christmas in their hearts, no one kept it better than Ebenezer Scrooge at the end of that great story. And I, and I just, I, I resonate with that so much because I love this season of year, and, and, and many of you do as well. I love the sights of Christmas, I love the decorations, I love the feel, the excitement, and the anticipation. But I don't know if there's anything that I really enjoy more in the season of Christmas than the music of Christmas. And, and again, I just appreciate David and our choir and our orchestra and our praise team for leading us so well this morning. Looking so forward to Merry Christmas Campbellsville next weekend. But we, we get a chance to sing these great songs of Christmas. We sing the great congregational hymns. We sing the newer choruses as well. But I gotta be honest. I like a lot of the other Christmas songs as well. I love the Frank Sinatra Christmas albums. I love the Tony Bennett Christmas albums, the Ella Fitzgerald Christmas albums, the Michael Buble Christmas albums. I love all of these because they bring to mind the songs of the season. 
from, from generation to generation. Mem remember when you were kids, when we were kids, we'd take that stack of Christmas albums and we'd put them on the turntable and let one fall in after the other. And then when we got a little older, it was that stack of CDs that you'd have in the CD changer ready for hours and hours of Christmas music. And then a couple of years ago, it was making sure that your iPod was loaded up with all of those Christmas CDs. Nowadays, it's all about the playlist that you share with people. If you follow me on Facebook or Twitter, even this morning, I made a link to Spotify for my Christmas playlist. And I, I just commend that to you because you can see very quickly that I just like a whole big gamut of Christmas songs. To sing at Christmas and to have Christmas carols is something that goes way, way back, not just to my childhood and to your childhood and not even to our grandparents or great-grandparents. Friends, it goes back even further than that particularly in the Gospel of Luke. Of all the things that we love about Luke, the Gospel writer, Luke is the guy, in my opinion, who started this whole idea of Christmas carols. Because in the Gospel of Luke, in those opening chapters, when the birth of Jesus is first foretold, and as people begin to understand just truly what this birth means, what do people do? They break out singing. It's almost like a Broadway musical. People just break out singing for no reason at all. We see this with Mary, you see it with the shepherds, you see it with Zechariah, you see it with Elizabeth, you see it with Anna, you see it with these people. When they find out about the birth of the Savior, what do they do? They begin to sing. They sing about Jesus, and they sing about his birth. I want to take just these, these months of December and look with you at the Christmas carols that we find in the Gospel of Luke. And I think the greatest one of all is found right here in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Now, I'm calling it Mary's song. Many people call this song the Magnificat because the first words that Mary says in her song are, my soul will magnify the Lord. But take a look at this song, when it happens, and, and how Mary can lift it up in such an amazing way. Again, looking at your Bibles at Luke chapter 1. Notice the setting once again. Now, we just picked it up at verse 46 when, when Luke says, and Mary said, I like to think of this as, and Mary sang, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. But remember again why Mary has lifted up this great song. With your Bibles open, go back to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And let's see this again. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Here's why Mary is singing. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. For behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Verse 38, Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary's song, lifting up the Lord. Notice what she says she wants to do in verse 46. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, what do you do when you magnify something? When you magnify something, you don't change it and you don't alter it. You take something for what it is, and you simply say, you know what? I want to focus on this. I want to make this thing big. I want to make this thing large so people can know it and people can experience it just like me. 
A biologist or a scientist, if he or she wants to magnify something, they put it under a microscope or view it through a telescope. You're not changing what you're looking at. You're simply focusing on it, making it large for everyone to know about. And this is what Mary wants us to understand with the Lord. He had blessed her so mightily, he had revealed to her amazing and, 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 and outstanding things. And she simply says, you know what? I want to throw the spotlight on him. I want to magnify him. Let me tell you about this God who has changed me. My soul magnifies the Lord. Mary is an amazing theologian. She knows God. She loves God. And she says, let me tell you about this God who has changed my life. So, as Mary's song magnifies the Lord, what do we see in this song? What does this song, this great Magnificat song, what does it tell us about God? Well, let's let Mary be the theologian this morning and show us all about the Lord. My soul magnifies God. What does she say about him? First of all, she says, my God is personal. Notice what she says in verse 46. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations shall call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Understand who Mary is. Now listen, we want to be biblical. We want to be good Baptists. We don't want to make more of Mary than we should. We should never make more of Mary than what the Bible says of her. But if you just simply read what the words say about her, she is an amazing young woman. But listen, she's humble. She's low. She is poor. And for, for any other young woman of, of the day in Mary's station, she was more than likely illiterate. And more than likely, she was considered a second-class citizen of her day. It doesn't make it right, but it was the culture of that day. Mary was the kind of person that you could pass by in the street and maybe never think a second thought about her. One of a, of, of a numberless population of young women in Nazareth in that day. But as many people as overlooked her, as many people as, as neglected her or would not give her the time of day or even think that she was all that special at all, Mary says, God has looked on me. My God has seen me. My God has come to me. He's looked on the humble estate of his servant. Now in Mary's day, it was the men who would teach the scripture. It was the men who would lead in the services. Mary says, God has seen me. Of all the things she magnifies about God, the first thing she says about him is, my God is personal, and he's come into my heart. And this is one of the first things I want to share with you this morning. You have to understand this about God. Of all the things that God is, and he is magnificent, and he is eternal, and he is amazing, and he is awesome. He is all of these things. But listen, God is personal. And he's coming to you this morning. He sees who you are. He sees what you are going through. He understands you intimately more so than anybody else. He is personal. Never lose sight of my soul magnifies the Lord because he's looked on me. She magnifies God because he's personal. Secondly, she magnifies God because he is powerful. Look at what Mary says about the power of God. Verse 48, he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. And look, look at verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, Holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. She glorifies God because of his power. Now notice what she says about his power. She says in verse 49, he's mighty. The word for mighty that, that Mary uses here is the same word from which we get our word dynamite. She's saying God is powerful. God is mighty. He works in our world. He changes things. And there is power in God that so far outstrips anything that we can know or could possibly reproduce. Mary spoke these words 2,000 years ago, but it's still the same thing today. Whether it's atomic power, 
or, or, or nuclear power or electric power or hydropower. Name any power you wish. God is above it all. God dwarfs it all. He is mighty in his power. And Mary even goes on to say, you know what? He has stretched out his arm for me. This connects back to the personal nature of God. But if you even want to string, if you even want to picture an arm that, that's so strong, a right arm that will work, that, that will do, this is the power that God has. He's mighty. Notice what else she says about his power. In verse 49, he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She says God is holy. This is his character. This is the one thing that you say about God that separates him from, from, from what we know. We are sinful. God is holy. This is God in his splendor. This is God in his perfection. This is God in his unchanging nature. He is holy. He's mighty. And he is holy. She's talking about the power of God. But then notice what else she says in verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him yes he's powerful yes he's mighty yes he is holy but never forget this part of god's power as well that's expressed and that we can know is his mercy when god forgives you're forgiven when god extends mercy mercy is given and it won't be taken back this is what god does with his power he bridges the gap that we could not bridge this is what he does. He's personal. He's powerful. She, she's magnifying the Lord for us. Notice what else she says about him. Also, God is purposeful. Now listen, God is doing these things through Mary. He's breaking forth into our world in a new and amazing way. He's personal in how he does it. He's certainly powerful in how he does it. But Mary also helps us understand just what he is doing. And what gives God's heart a thrill in what he does. Notice this. Look at verse 51. Such an insight here into the character of God. He's shown strength with his arm. Look at verse 51. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This is God's agenda. This is what God does. And Mary gets it. Mary understands it. When God is at work in our world and when God is at work through you, what does he want to do? Mary gets at the purpose. Do you understand this about God? If someone is proud, if someone is proud of themselves, and if they are exalting themselves above others, if someone is, is exercising authority over others in a cruel way or in a selfish way, sometimes we have to live under that. And sometimes we even can suffer under that. But here's what Mary tells us. The God of love and the God of power, the personal God, says, here's what I'm up to in your world. The proud person, I'm going to bring low. And the humble person, I'm going to exalt. Listen, God loves to turn the table. And he does it all the time. Mary helps us understand this. Now, who better to tell us this than Mary? Again, who Mary was and her station in life. She was, she was a humble, poor, young woman herself, not even married yet. She had no property. She had no claim to any sort of authority at all. And of all the people that God could have come to, of all the young women he could have chosen, he chose her. But through her life, through her example, God is going to turn the tables in the most amazing way yet. The ones in power brought low. Those who humble themselves before the Lord, those who are repentant and broken and know how spiritually poor they are, God will raise up. This is what God does. It's what he's always done. It's what he's doing right now. And Mary says, I'll magnify this about the Lord. I want you to understand this about where you may be in your life right now. You may feel like there is someone in your life who is exercising some sort of, a, of cruel authority over you, maybe with, with their thumb on you to keep you down. Understand this. God is here, and his purpose is to turn those tables and to exalt the humble and bring the poor 
rather bring the proud down. And also, this is, this, this is a fresh word for all of us, lest we become proud or lest we, we want to hold on too tightly to what we've got. God says, I'll bring down those who are rich. I'll bring down those who are proud. And I will exalt the humble. And this is what God does. He is purposeful in how he acts. But then I want you to notice the most amazing thing of all that Mary helps us understand about God. She reminds us that God is promise-keeping. You know, Mary what, may have been illiterate. Mary not, may not have been able to attend all the, all the Bible study classes that all the men could go to, but I got to tell you, she knew her Bible. She knew her scripture. She knew the stories, and she knew the truth so steeped in this and it must have been because in the family the stories were told the truth was imparted generation to generation listen mary knew her god and she knew what he had promised to his people now notice this because she brings this in look at verse 52 mary says of god he's brought down the mighty from their thrones he's exalted those of humble estate he's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty look at verse 54 He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Uh, And again, for some of us here today, we have no idea what Mary's talking about. Abraham, father, spoke to him. What's she talking about? Listen, Mary knows the truth. She knows the word. And what is she saying to us? She's simply saying that God made a promise, and he made a promise to his people. And if we talk about Mary singing this song 2,000 years ago, Mary herself refers to a promise that God had made 2,000 years before her, all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Abraham, where God said to that one man, he said, Abraham, if you'll start following me, not knowing where I'm going to lead you, with all sorts of questions, if you will simply start following me and trusting me, Abraham, this is what I promise you. I promise you that you will have a huge family. I promise you, Abraham, that from your family will come a nation, and from this nation will come a Savior, so that the world will be blessed through you, Abraham, through your family, and through your simple trust and faith. So, If I add this up correctly, we're talking about a promise that God made 4,000 years ago. Mary magnifies him as a promise-keeping God. He promised Abraham, Abraham, you've got my word on this. I will bless the world through your family and through the nation that comes through you. And so what's Mary saying? What's Mary realizing? She's realizing that because of what is going to happen in her and through her, the promise that God had made 2,000 years before her story was now coming true. A promise-keeping God. Now, I don't know about you, but I have trouble remembering what I promised last week, much less 2,000 years ago. But Mary magnifies the Lord. She said, listen, if God promised it, it's going to happen. If God said he will do it, he will do it. History ebbs and flows, people come and go. People can disappoint us, people can come through. It doesn't matter. God's promise will happen. He's the promise-keeping God. Folks, he's made a promise to you. He has promised you that, that through faith in his son, your sins are forgiven. And he's made you a promise that through faith in his son, you do have an eternal relationship with God that nothing can take away from you. That's his promise to you. He's the promise-keeping God. See what Mary's all about here. Through this simple woman of faith, God says, let me break out truth. And then she says, you know what? God is so awesome. He is so amazing. I've got to talk about him. I've got to magnify him. I've got to make him large. And this is what she does. The thing I love about Mary is she's so joyful. She's so full of the joy of the Lord. Now, you and I understand what will happen. We understand the travail and and, and the hardship that she will experience. She doesn't know it yet, but we know that when it comes time for her to give birth, she won't be able to do it in a house 
or, 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 or in any kind of good shelter. She'll have to give birth in a barn and lay her newborn child in a feed box. We know that's what's going to happen to her. And we also know the heartache that will one day be hers when she, watch, when she watches this son of hers be tortured and abused and die. She'll watch him die. We know this is what's coming for her. But here when we see her in Luke chapter 1, she is so full of joy. Why? Why is she so full of joy? Well, not only is she full of joy because she magnifies God, but she's also full of joy because she says yes to this God that she's magnifying. Now, did you catch that? Over in Luke 1, when, when, when Gabriel lays it out for her, when, when Gabriel lays down this truth and he says, Mary, as, as difficult as it is for you to understand this, understand what God is going to do. You're going to give birth to the Savior. And yes, you are a virgin. You will remain a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will give birth to the Savior. And then you and Joseph will have your family. But first, you give birth even though you are a virgin. Understanding what this means thinking about, and I think even at the outset, she must have known what this would have meant, the rumors that would continue, because understand that when she goes through her pregnancy, she's showing after a while, but she's not married yet. Joseph himself was even tempted with divorcing her because she was with child and they weren't married yet. But even with all of that, notice what Mary says to God. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, folks, I believe at this point that Mary had a choice. Mary had a decision to make. Gabriel lays it out. Mary, this is what God wants to do, and I firmly believe that Mary could have said, No, I want no part of this. But instead, she said, and this is why Luke makes such a big deal out of it. Instead, she says, let it be. Let it be so. I am the handmaiden of the Lord. That's what, listen, that's what makes Mary special. Her trust and obedience and the simple way she had of saying, God, you've told me some incredible things. I don't fully understand all that you're going to do, but I trust you. Let it be so. She said, yes. Here's the decision for you and I to make this morning. Will you say yes to this magnificent God? Everything that Mary has said about him, he is personal, he's powerful, he's purposeful, he's promise-keeping. Everything that Mary said about God is still true today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as much as God can break through into the life of, of, of this humble Young woman in Nazareth, listen, God wants to break through in your life and through you to do amazing, incredible things. And it might very well be that he's already given you a foretaste of what he wants to do. But listen, folks, you got to be willing. You have to trust him and you have to say yes to the Lord. Use me, work through me. All that I have, God, is yours. I surrender fully and completely to you. If you want to know the joy of the Lord this Christmas, then simply say, God, you are magnificent. You are amazing. And I say yes. 